And thank you for tuning in. You are listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program is a wonderful guest that we've had a couple of times on the program before, and he is the number one New York Times bestselling author of How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century. He is also the writer of The Rough Times, which has been read by more than 500,000 people, half a million, I should say, actually closer to 700,000. And apparently when this guy has something to say when it comes to the financial prosperity and strength of people, this is something you want to listen to. And I'd like to welcome to the program Howard J. Ruff. And Howard, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Oh, thank you. You bet. Now, uh, as we read through How to Prosper During the Coming Bad Years in the 21st Century, I noticed that you've got conventional wisdom out there that CNN, MSNBC, CNBC, all the major networks just don't seem to be covering. Well, they're not interested in my part. They're pretty much controlled by the the Wall Street attitude. And the Wall Street attitude is um, pretty much doesn't like the things I've been recommending. They're not things that they make uh, commissions on. <laughs> uh, for, for example, over a period I made uh, my subscribers a lot of money in gold and silver way back in the 70s, mm-hmm. and they didn't make any commissions on gold and silver. So that's not what they what they're going what Wall Street is going to push. And if you've adopted the Wall Street mentality, you pretty much are influenced by their thinking. You know, there's no doubt about that. I was just watching uh, a bit uh, of of CNN, which it's kind of funny how that network has changed over the years because they were just about out of business back in the early 90s until we went into Desert Storm and they embedded themselves with the U.S. government. And now all of a sudden they seem to be the big cheeses about this whole economic situation in the first place. And what was most interesting is there was this little quip about how all of a sudden General Motors has lost $30 billion. And I thought, has this company ever made that much money in revenues, let alone how did they lose that kind of money in such a short period of time? Darn if I know. I haven't followed them that <laughs> I knew you that closely. I don't follow it that closely either. These are just you know points you just kind of catch a flash and go, now how is this possible? So, Yeah, well, the... Uh... You know, there, there's a whole lot of things I don't know anything about. I know an awful lot about a few things, and I've done very well with those th- few things. and know, know them well enough that so I can tell my subscribers how to make money doing them. Mm-hmm. But uh, there's, uh, there's a, a lot of questions. You could ask me some hard questions that I wouldn't know the answer to. And, and incidentally, you're not supposed to ask me any hard questions, which are the ones I don't know the answer to. <laughs> well, that's true, though. It's always do a couple of good things better than everyone else, and you'll stay ahead of the pack. Now, according to you, that as you were saying, that most money will be made by a minority of people, but not through Wall Street. What specific areas will they be making that money in? Uh, I beg your pardon? I was saying that you were saying that as far as money is uh, made by a, a minority of people, but not through Wall Street, what areas do you think these people will be making their money in? Well, it's not always true, but it's certainly true this time, and it's often true at major turning points when uh, traditional investing is being discredited, as it is now, because of the big losses suffered by uh, the traditional conservative approaches to investing. And it's at times like this, that only a few people, relatively few people, have the guts to make major changes and to throw off the old ways. And so it's a, it's going to take people with a certain mindset in order to make money. And the uh, and I think one other reason I'm I'm a touting a certain approach to making money and investing your your assets. And uh, and, and Wall Street doesn't like what I have to say, so I'm not going to get a lot of. Uh, a lot of publicity or help and support from Wall Street or from the bookstores even, because my big my big uh, splash in the public came actually in the 70s, and uh, and many of the book buyers are too uh, too young to even remember who I am. They think I'm a new writer. <laughs> I, I had this monstrous bestseller, two and a half, two point six million copies way back then, and I've revised the book and reissued it. Uh, updated for the 80s, but the average uh, book buyer at the stores doesn't know who the heck I am. Hmm. Now, Howard, tell us specifically, since we enjoy people just like yourself who come on the program and they say, okay, conventional wisdom, Wall Street, as you're saying, mainstream media, it seems like, and that up to and includes book publishers, 
don't like what you have to say, but we're interested in what you have to say because this could be a very clear solution. Well, I think that's very smart of you because I think what I have to say is brilliant, of course. So, well, we uh, like brilliant minds on the Beyond 50 radio program, quite frankly. <laughs> there, you, there you go. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but I'm humble about it. So now, as I was asking the question, what is it that they don't want to hear you say? Well, they don't want me touting things that they don't make commissions on. For example, one of my major recommendations, as it was in the 70s when we made a bunch of money with this on this, is gold and silver. Mm -hmm. And gold and silver are not investments which are pushed by uh, uh, Wall Street. Wall Street is pushing paper-denominated investments. So you can buy buy stock and you get a piece of paper to uh, as the value of which hold. Well, uh, Wall Street took beatings of 40, 50, 60 percent in uh, September and October last year, and so that isn't working. And uh, they've uh, recovered a bit, but only a relatively small portion of what they lost. Incidentally, gold actually, in that in the period uh, fr- including and since then, has made about 7 percent. That's pretty good. That's better than a 40, 50, 60 percent loss. Mm-hmm. And they... Uh, and most people, even the gold bugs, aren't really touting silver, which I am, which I think is a better investment than gold. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, it's interesting, uh, Howard, that you talk about how Wall Street likes to push paper. And I was remembering, as I was reading way back in the day, some of the philosophies of uh, the, the big investor Warren Buffett. He says, I never invest in anything that I can't understand simply. And when you take a look at gold and silver, as you're talking about, that just seems simple, and because it lacks complexity and it's easy to understand, you can see why your Wall Streeters would say, yeah, you want to go ahead and invest in what I have to do because then I can control your understanding about it versus well, your, gold and silver. Your broker doesn't have to be terribly smart to recommend that. He might, if you recommend a stock in a company, he's expected to know everything about that company, but gold just simply know a few things. It's a beautiful a gold-colored lump of metal. And you can get it from a local coin dealer, and that's uh, that's awfully simple. Mm. You can sell it through a, uh, your uh, local coin dealer, and there's a, probably a coin dealer within a mile of your house, wherever you live, and so that's too simple. And that uh, so if the broker recommends that you buy gold and silver, they'll have to sell some of their stock, take the money out of their account, and go off and um, and make some money for the coin dealer, and they don't like that. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that on our last program you were talking about hedging against inflation, and one of the things you were talking about were sort of stockpiling uh, things such as food by buying double or triple each time you go to the market because of the fact is, as you see inflation just going crazy, that food is going to cost quite a bit more, and it's better to kind of buy now while you have some some value to your money than, say, a year from now. Well, uh, the... uh we don't have inflation now. We're going through a deflationary period. But strangely enough, in that deflation are the uh, the roots of inflation because the government thinks of uh, deflation as uh, synonymous with depression. And they'll do anything to fight it. And the only way they know how to fight it is to throw money at it. Mm-hmm. Well, this government's throwing trillions of dollars at it. And those trillions of dollars create inflation because inflation is always an expansion of the supply of paper money, so that's it's not happening yet. But the, uh, the advantage is that if you uh, stockpile some things, and I'm not just talking about food, I'm talking about all commodities you buy regularly, ranging from diapers to soap to motor oil and and food. Uh, they'll buy a can of tuna, buy a case of it, and and set it aside. That means you'll be buying at today's cheap prices and consuming at tomorrow's higher prices, and that's really an investment situation. That's buy low, sell high. Mhm. Yeah, it's funny, you know, as you read through how to prosper during the coming bad years of the 21st century is that a lot of what you share in the book it just seems so obvious, but yet it seems like a lot of people just don't get it or understand it at times. Yeah, that that's it. And I think that uh, uh government trying to uh, has taken over Wall Street as they've forced a lot of mergers uh, and, uh, and and government wants the stock market to come back. They want the, the good days to return. And those good days are not going to return, especially by spending a lot of money. This is Keynesian economics. It was just 
or were disqualified many years ago, and it doesn't work. And all the money that's being created and thrown at the problem of, by uh, Obama is not going to end this uh, downturn. And in fact, it's going to give him a worse problem, which is a runaway hyperinflation, which is big time inflation. And that disrupts the economy more than what's going on now. Mm-hmm. Now, during his run for office, uh, it seemed that the conservative side, the Republican side, John McCain and Sarah Palin, began to tout socialism. Now, is that what you see our country moving in in, in that direction? I mean, it seems like it's becoming obvious. But well, you're uh, right let's about, talk about that. Uh, McCain. He he was not touting socialism, but he was simply touting things that lead to socialism. Palin didn't was not on that side of the fence. Uh, she was uh, much too conservative with free market principles for that. And so so don't let's make sure we don't uh, blame her for. No, I wasn't blaming either of the two. This is just what you would hear them say well, at their rallies. Obama. I'm blaming McCain. Oh, you're blaming McCain. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. Well, the uh, let me define socialism for you. Okay. Socialism is government owning or controlling the means of production. That's the economist's classic definition of it. And that that's what Hitler did in Germany. He took control of their of manufacturing so he could manufacture his war machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, Russia took control of every industry, so the government owned everything. And that's government owning or controlling the means of production. Well, it scares me to know that uh, between the uh, uh, the union and government, they gonna, they're going to own 89% of General Motors. They've already fired the CEO. They're going to be telling them what kind of cars to produce. Uh, as beholden to the uh, environmentalists who think that's a good idea, and uh, so this is this is pure socialism. This is dangerous socialism. This is government controlling the means of production. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've, A A I G, for example, they're talking about uh, wanting to cut uh, bonuses, but and then giving them a whole lot of money. Now, how are they going to make make a profit if they won't pay bonuses to their best people who leave? The best people are the ones who would produce a profit if they were there. So these are stupid government decisions. And government is dumb. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I I uh, love my country, but I fear and distrust my government. And socialism has failed whenever it's been tried, every single time, without exception, and big time. Well, Howard, I'm curious, though. You know, it, it seems that the perception might be that during the Obama administration that we're moving towards socialism but but hasn't this been going on for a while oh yeah we've been and we've been creeping it's been creeping socialism for a hundred years okay but now it's galloping socialism, galloping <laughs> socialism. <laughs> jumping to hyperspace <laughs> and so that's exactly what obama has done and the uh but the 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 many years of uh step-by-step uh, step, um, minute steps towards socialism it's conditioned the public and now, let me give you some statistics that might scare you a little bit. Uh, the uh, uh, Right now, half of the people in America get a check from some level of government. Mm-hmm. So where's the constituency to reduce spending? None. Half of the people in America don't pay taxes. In fact, they get something from the government as, as part of not paying taxes. So where's the constituency for cutting taxes? So the majority of the people in America are for doing all those things which socialism claims to do for you. We'll take care of you. Mm-hmm. Well, don't worry about it. We're going to do this. And so government's going to take over health control. Uh, he- or health... Um, health care. Health care. Yeah, yes. the government's going to take over health care. And, uh, and so that's supposed to be good. Well, when is government good at anything? It, you know, it's amazing to, to think that it's been going on for such a long time and that we've been conditioned to believe that we're moving in the right direction. Now, this isn't something that we totally point the finger on the new administration about, is it? Well, uh, no, they've taken, just taken advantage of the opportunity. And I, I think the uh, it's the general public's ignorance of these things that's, that's important. Right now, there was a, a recent poll, a uh, Pew poll, that, indicated that almost half of the people in America thought socialism was better than capitalism. And this uh, administration is trying to blame capitalism for the troubles they have here, when actually the troubles 
our government. The, the, the problem was created by government starting in 1977 mm-hmm. uh, with legislation, uh, which this, the politicians decided they could buy a lot of votes. If people who would ordinarily not be able to buy a home would be able to buy one, so they uh, they forced the banks to approve mortgages that they would have turned down based on no down payment, based on uh, poor, poor credit, uh, poor job hi- histories. And so they uh, they did this. And so uh, bankers could even go to jail if they started turning down those kinds of mortgages. And that's what is the root of the thing. That's what created the, the big real estate boom and bubble. And all bubbles eventually burst. Mm-hmm. And that did. And that created the problems because these mortgages, and this is when government got really clever, they allowed the banks, uh, they're the uh, mortgage brokers and the bankers, to uh, collect these mortgages into mortgage-backed security, bond-like instruments supported by mortgages. They got the uh, credit reporting agencies to uh, give them AAA ratings, and the banks started buying these up and putting them on their balance sheets. And when, they, when the thing broke, and all of a sudden they realized that they had a bunch of crappy stuff uh, in, their, in their balance sheets, the bankers all of a sudden... Uh, were in trouble. Their their um, underpinnings and their balance sheets was pretty was really weak and getting weaker by the minute. And consequently, that that's what caused the whole problem. And that's why so many gigantic firms failed almost overnight. Uh, partly because the, the accountants had decided the accounting board had decided that they had to mark those um, assets to market, which means value them as the market did. And the market had disappeared. No one would buy or sell these bonds. Mm-hmm. And consequently, uh, some of the banks all of a sudden find their balance sheets disappeared out from under them. And so we had some huge failures, like Lehman Brothers, uh, some huge uh, mergers uh, to, that caused a lot of the problem. And all of a sudden, this, this thing was uh, like uh, self-reinforcing. It's interesting, Howard, uh, that you bring this to light because when you take a look at the history of America, capitalism was the foundation of the country because because it allowed free market competition, which is very healthy because it allows prices to kind of stay reasonable so everybody can get into the game. I think what's interesting is that when you look at the last eight years of the Bush administration, it was seemingly like the last four, give or take, that people began to just disdain the government, and mostly because of the handling of the war in Iraq. But then all of a sudden you've seen, just toward the end of the Bush administration, a slight flip, and then all of a sudden the government became the hero and everybody can't stand the capitalists. How was that possible that such a sleight of hand, if you will, had occurred? Well, I blame Bush. Of course, Bush is responsible. Yeah, brain did get a couple of days ago. It's Bush's fault. Blame everything on Bush. For sure? (laughs) No, that's what they said. (laughs) Now, um, so as you say, we're galloping towards socialism. So the welfare of the country, how's that going to look if we continue in this direction? It's very very difficult. uh, Nothing disrupts an economy more than serious inflation. Big time. Mm -hmm. And... uh, we're going to have a disrupted economy. And uh, Obama has painted himself into a corner by launching this monster socialist effort. And he's going to find himself dealing with a bigger problem than the one he has now with the coming hyperinflation. Now, uh, incidentally, I don't have a crystal ball, so I can't tell you exactly what's going to start, but it's one of my best guess, and that's all it is, my best guess. It's before the end of this year when it will start. And when that starts, then the investments that benefit from inflation are going to start prospering. And as Will Rogers said, invest in inflation. It's the only thing that's going up. <laughs> he always had good common sense uh, <laughs> ways of uh, investing there. So because we know, based on what you're saying to us here, what can people do? We've already talked about how you stockpile, if you will, buy your food at prices now when they're low, and then, you know, as you're saying, sell high. So what are some other measures, as well as you said gold and silver is another way to invest to a good insurance, if you will. What are some other things people can do right now that they can prepare for what's about to come ahead? 
Well, I think that the uh, gold and silver has a lot of permutations. And there's, for example, there's all kinds of minor mining stocks, gold and silver mining stocks. And as gold and silver rise, the profits of the mining companies are going to increase, and you're going to make a lot of money in mining stocks. Now, the, the gold and silver in an inflationary spiral always precede the mining stocks. They move first. But now, the, and so the mining stocks are very, very cheap right now. And they're very good. It's, they're very good investments, and you can get that through your broker. A lot of them, however, are outside the country, like in Canada. And so I have recommended brokers that's listed in my book uh, that can deal with Canadian stocks where the average person uh, often can't. So that's a suggestion. I have a couple of other suggestions which have nothing to do with inflation, really, except indirectly. For example, uh, inflation is going to drive up the price of gasoline again. We're going to see gasoline up a hundred dollars a barrel soon, or mm-hmm. oil, and we're going to see gasoline in the four to five dollar range. It started to rise now; it's even off the bottom substantially. And when that happens, uh, all of a sudden we're going to need energy, and so the the uh, current environmentalist uh, curse on drilling, uh, for example, offshore drilling, is going to be overwhelmed by the public saying, "Hey." It's stupid not to drill holes here and, and, and make our own energy rather than depending on uh, foreigners for it. And so the, uh, the the best way to bet on that, in my opinion, is the oil service companies, the people that make and service the oil oil rigs. So I like the oil service companies. Mm-hmm. And it's companies like Schlumberger, and, uh, the, the, uh, which is the biggest of them. And they uh, that looks good. Also, the, when, as the price of uh, energy is rising and rising, we're going to have a renewed effort, a renewed uh, uh, urge to want to build nuclear plants. And there are 35 nuclear plants under production or on the drawing boards right now, and there's only half enough uranium above ground to service them. So I like uranium mining stocks, Canadian and American uranium, uranium mining stocks. Mm-hmm. And that all the problems that are we're being told about like waste and so forth. They're technically under control, and you can do this, and we can build very safe nuclear plants today. Oh, it's it's just it's that what you offer, Howard, just seems so simple. Now, I think to myself as a person listening to the program here, that as you suggest these recommendations. Uh, what kind of money does a person need to have to get started to invest in these things, and what kind of potential returns will there be for them? Well, the answer to the first question is whatever money you've got. Okay. And, and if you, uh, and one of my other pieces of advice is to get out of debt. And if you're out of debt and you're not making interest payments, you have discretionary income, whatever it is, small or large. And it, this is an opportunity to turn small amounts of money into genuine fortunes. And what percentage of return will you get? Well, Let's take, for example, gold. Gold uh, in the inflationary spiral in the 70s finally peaked out at $850 an ounce in 1980. Now, if if you adjust that for inflation, in in order to make a new high, even to, to equal that high adjusted for inflation, gold will have to go over 2200 So you can do the math yourself, what that return would be. But you have to remember that uh, the world is littered with dead paper currencies. All producers of paper currencies eventually produce too much of it to buy votes, and eventually the currency dies. It becomes literally worthless. Mm-hmm. It's, you can't even use the toilet paper because it doesn't absorb <laughs> water very well. <laughs> so the, uh, uh, in, in my opinion, we're, we're talking about maybe an inflationary spiral that will end if they get a sudden rush of brains to the head and start doing the right thing. Um, as they did in the 80s, but now we've gone so far, they may not be able to do that. And it may mean that we join, that our dollar is in the dustbin of history. And when that happens, remember, uh, currency is supposed to be a means of exchange in a store of value, right? Right. It's still a means of exchange, but it ceased being a store of value a long time ago. Mm-hmm. It's diminishing in value. Uh, but with uh, after you get past this temporary hiccup in the in the inflationary spiral, but we've had even minor inflation, what we call disinflation, which means less inflation than we had in the past for a number of years. But with, when it heats up, it's going to go like crazy. 
Hey, you know, it's just so incredible to think that all this has happened, and when you pay attention to how uh, uh, mainstream media, if you will, is serving information, you just don't hear things like this at all, and you kind of wonder, you know, what's going on, like, uh, you know, for instance, falling home prices. People are kind of worried about, well, you know, I bought this home at, say, $200,000, and now it's worth 150000 How can somebody, you know, with the falling home prices save equity in their home that they already have, for instance? Well, there are an awful lot of people that bought homes that shouldn't have bought them. They bought too much homes, more mm-hmm. than they could afford, and they're going to lose them. In my opinion, trying the government trying to save everybody's mortgage is a very dumb thing because the only way the market clears is to allow those that shouldn't have bought them and made their bad investments to lose them. Mm-hmm. Now, that sounds kind of heartless, and, uh, of course, the, uh, the democratic approach is we have to save all the, the mortgage holders, and that sounds wonderfully and full of heart, and I sound heartless. But nevertheless, that's the way the world works. And so the uh, uh, so many of the steps the government is taking are to preserve the old way of things, trying to, and, and, and it, it's, a, uh, it's a hopeless case. They can't preserve the way things used to be. The old world has died, and there's a new world. Eventually, someday, we're going to have, a, have to have a currency that's based on some, uh, some standard, some form of a gold standard, perhaps. And uh, I don't know what form it's going to take, and that's not my job. My job is not to, to tell you in the future of the, what the details are going to be or to tell the government what to do. They wouldn't listen to me anyway. Mm-hmm. My job is to tell the average individual... What are you going to do with your family, your resources, and the assets you have? And it's such a pleasure to have you on the program to talk about things that you're just not hearing out there. And, and it's interesting because, as you said, they stepped in in the 70s, created legislation that basically guaranteed, if you will, uh, for lack of a better word, that people can go out and get homes whether they can afford them or not. And so now they're realizing that they can't afford them and they're losing their homes and the government's so trying to be the hero them. again. Price have come down below what they owe, so they just walk away. In fact, I just saw a picture in the Wall Street Journal of them demolishing some homes that a, a bank had uh, foreclosed on, and rather than dump them into a poor market, they just decided to, to demolish them. You know, that's an interesting point because I was just seeing again, and I just do this briefly. I don't really sit and watch the news too much. Uh, and that is, there was a guy that had bought a home in what he believed was a prosperous neighborhood, and it was at the time. And he says it's really eerie now because, just as you said, there are idle bulldozers sitting in the neighborhood, and he's pretty much the only one left. And he says it really gives me an eerie feeling to be in this neighborhood and to watch them about ready to demolish these homes. And and you said the very same thing. Yeah, well, the the underlying problem is the inclination of people who want to go into debt. For example... I was at church, and I looked at the parking lot, and I counted the number of cars, and I figured about $20,000 worth of debt on each car, and there was millions of dollars worth of debt in the car. And I'm, uh, and being a practicing Mormon, and going to keep practicing when I get it right, uh, our <laughs> church leaders have told us to avoid debt for many years, probably the, the most disregarded counsel they ever gave us. And, so they, but, uh, and the same thing with credit cards. Now they want the company, uh, the government wants to save the credit card companies, and uh, and and then I hear these ads from these companies about credit cards. The thing credit card companies don't want to tell you is that you can settle your debt for a fraction of what you owe. That's just plain immoral. Mm-hmm. It was immoral going into debt in the first place, and it's immoral the way you're treat. They're treating it. I don't know what the answer is. All I know is I feel bad about it. And that's so totally true, how you see the changing paradigm, even of the commercials. I remember that it wasn't too long ago that it was take out, you know, the the equity out of your home to pay off the debt that you got yourself into because they knew that once you did that, you would just do the same thing again. Well, that was sometimes at one point in time that might have been a good idea. Mm Mm-hmm. Hmm, interesting stuff. Now, you also have an excellent strategy for collecting your insurance before you die. Tell us about that. Well, there are some companies that uh, would like to buy your insurance policy from it for more than the cash value. For example, if they own the insurance policy and they've got a discount and they'll collect when you die, it's they're going to collect more than they pay you. And so if you're over 65, there's some companies that will actually 
uh, buy your insurance policy from you, and you'll you'll be able to cash it in for more than the cash value because they'll give you some money for it. And that's a simple strategy and and uh, one that uh, can make some sense for, for a lot of people over 65. It works best with whole life insurance, but also works with term insurance. Now, though, if you do, I guess, sell your insurance, though, and you receive the cash, doesn't that come out as a taxable rate? Oh, now you've asked me a question that I don't have the quick answer to. I'd have to look that up. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. I just remember there was a particular financial strategist that was recommending the cash value insurances, and I remember that it was back in the 80s. There was a particular company that was mavericking the fact, no, you want to buy a term and invest the difference. But when I understood what cash value insurance, what it was you know, created for and how it was used, and I thought, well, that makes a lot of sense because you're allowed to borrow the money out so you didn't have to pay taxes on it. And that's why I wondered about that. Yeah, well, that's not a, that's not really a factor. I don't know how that would apply mm-hmm. if you sold the value of your of your uh, uh, insurance that you well, were not uh, uh, lucky enough to cash in on by dying. Oh, <laughs> well, that's true. Now, Howard, go ahead and please tell us how people can get a hold of your newsletter, and then that way they can you know, get themselves on track to being Okay, prepared. and I'll also tell you, and I think I may have told this last time you uh, interviewed me, I don't remember. I'm even going to tell you how you can rip me off, okay? Hear that? I'm ready to go. <laughs> okay, you go to my website, www.roughtimes.com, and there you read all more about me than you ever wanted to know. And you can sign up for my newsletter if you like what you read at $165 a year. That's not a lot of money. And then I'll send you, uh, in addition to the newsletter every three weeks, I'll send you a free book, copy of the book we talked about earlier, and even a CD. I used to be a professional singer. It was pretty good one time. I made it a great <laughs> CD. And with so Will Rogers, no less. <laughs> and then if you're not happy with the newsletter after a couple of issues, you can cancel it and keep the book. You can't go wrong there, folks. <laughs> a real bailout that won't cost you anything. Go ahead and give the website out again one more time. That's roughtimes.com, R-U-F-F-T-I-M-E-S.com, www.roughtimes.com. Well, Howard Ruff, it's always very entertaining and insightful when you're on the program here, and, and you know I really hope that people take heed and pay attention to changing the way they're thinking instead of following the herd right off the cliff. Well, and, that's... Us old guys sometimes have some not good things to say because we lived through this. Mm-hmm. We've, we've lived, a lot of the brokers are too young to have even uh, lived through these bull markets and bear markets, the gold markets up and down. But uh, here I am. I'm old enough to remember all this stuff. Mm-hmm. And so but I am an old guy. But I figure I've got five or ten good years left to tell people what they, uh, how they can benefit from what's going on using the accumulated wisdom of the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, incidentally, I've, I'm, I'm getting old. I've even started uh, preparing for the day I'll have a funeral one day, and I've even figured out what I'm going to write on my funeral or, or my uh, my uh, tombstone. Uh, you want to hear that? Sure. <laughs> I told you I was sick. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Ruff, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond Fifty Radio Program today. Happy to do it. You bet. Again, go to roughtimes.com and sign up for his free, or not, excuse me, free newsletter. That's what we give. Sign up for his newsletter and uh, and be sure to get yourself ready and prepared and quit following conventional wisdom because, as it sounds, it's kind of leading us into an area we don't want to be. I also encourage you to sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter, and that's at beyond50radio.com, the number 50 with a 50. I'm Daniel Davis. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past halfway.